Coming up on Tech News Today, Motorola's Design It Yourself phone, Samsung snaps up Boxy, and Microsoft's unstoppable Julie Larson Green. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, July 3rd, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world. Put them in some context for you, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. Motorola has an ad out and a sign-up page up for the much-rumored Moto X phone. The ad will be showing up in today's major papers, like the New York Times and the USA Today. It claims the phone will be assembled in the USA and, somewhat more intriguing, designed by you. I don't mean just you. It's the first smartphone you can design yourself. So, in my case, the design won't be that good. Bloomberg reports that Apple and Time Warner Cable are close to a deal to let subscribers stream programming with their Apple TVs and maybe be live in a few months. If true, the partnership would be Apple TV's first offering of live TV along with video on demand. But Time Warner Cable already allows third-party products like Roku and soon the Xbox 360 to act as an extra cable box as long as the customer already has a subscription. More murmurs about the Microsoft management mix-up. Bloomberg says that Steve Ballmer is considering putting Tony Bates in charge of acquisitions and relationships with software developers. Bates is currently the president of Skype. Windows head Julie Larson Green would move over to uh, oversee hardware engineering for the entire company. The final plans for the Microsoft shakeup are expected to be announced as early as next week. No mention was made of whether Clippy would become head of office, though. What about Bob? Is Bob getting any? He's bringing Bob's janitor now. Uh, YouTube has renewed its deal with music video distributor Vivo. This means YouTube's most popular videos will remain available. But YouTube's Google had to throw some cash at the problem to make it happen. YouTube said in a statement, we made an investment in Vivo. And Billboard estimates that Google had to buy a 7% stake in Vivo to make it happen. Yahoo apparently cannot stop buying companies. As previously rumored, iOS app Queeky, that's Q-W-I-K-I, -I, is Marissa Meyer's latest acquisition. It's a social video sharing service with filters and photo transitions and soundtracks that you use to create stories online. Quiki gives Yahoo its own video sharing platform, which is a pretty hot commodity on the web these days. The deal is said to be around $50 million. A security breach at Ubisoft has the company warning its account holders that some of their data may have been compromised. Ubisoft says the subscriber's credit card and debit card details are safe. However, email addresses, usernames, and encrypted passwords were illegally accessed. Ubisoft said its database housed information for 58 million people. The Washington Examiner reports the U.S. State Department spent $630,000 on a marketing campaign to increase Facebook likes from 100,000 to more than 2 million on the State Department Facebook page. In a report, the agency's inspector general said many in the bureau criticized the advertising campaigns as, quote, buying fans. See, you don't need a secret server access prism thing. Just uh, spend a little money on Facebook and everybody will just give you their information. Apple has hired Paul Deneuve, the former CEO of fashion house Yves Saint Laurent, to work on special projects. His new position hasn't been further defined, but in a statement provided to Bloomberg, Apple confirmed he would indeed be a VP, reporting straight to CEO Tim Cook. Several Israeli news sources report this morning that Samsung has purchased Boxy for $30 million and will use Boxy Tech and Samsung TVs. TechCrunch saying their sources have confirmed the deal. Boxy told Engadget, we can't comment on the accuracy of those reports and Samsung has not yet responded to inquiries at this time. You know what we don't cover enough of? 
feature phones. And we're about to fix that right now because Nokia introduced the Nokia 207 and 208, two brand new feature phones. They both run Nokia's Series 40 OS. They both have a 2.4-inch display, 64 megabytes of RAM. That's not a lot at all. 256 megabytes of internal space. You can expand that with micro SD cards. So what's the difference between the 207 and 208? The 207 does not have a rear-facing camera, and the 208 will be available with a dual SIM variant. They will cost 52 euros each and go on sale in the third quarter of this year. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by ProXPN. More than ever, your online freedom is threatened, uh, whether it's an ISP wanting to see what you're up to. Is that torrent you're using actually uh, legitimate? None of their business, and the government shouldn't be spying on you either. The, the worst part is when you're in a coffee shop or a hotel or an airport and you're using that free public Wi-Fi, there are ways that people can sniff out your cookies. They can get into your account. Don't take any of those risks. Use what I use, ProXPN. It's a global VPN, virtual private network, that works with almost any internet connection. I set it up on my tablet, on my phone, on my laptop, because it's PPTP. You can use it via OpenVPN or PPTP, but it's a global, secure, encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth, and you can use anything you use on the web without any prying eyes, without any filters. It's 512-bit encryption. ProXPN software for Windows and Mac offers advanced controls, letting you select the programs and ports you want to anonymously route through ProXPN servers if you don't want everything going through the VPN, just a couple of things. Works with your iOS or Android device, allowing you to use your data plan or public corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy. Plus, they have world-class customer support. And as I mentioned, Steve Gibson gave it a great review on security. Now, that was a clincher for me. So go try it out. ProXPN.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are normally $9.95 a month or $74.95 for an entire year. But we've got a special offer. Use the code TNT and you'll get 20% off for the lifetime of your account for, for forever. That's less than $5, $5 a month on the yearly plan. If you're not satisfied with that, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. But I think you're going to like it. Go try it out. ProXPN.com slash twit. Sign up with the code TNT. And we thank ProXPN for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss the stories of the day, at least for part of the show, we're happy to have Natalie Morris of CrashTestMom.com. How's it going, Natalie? Good to have you back. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's well, going. Thank you for asking that, too. <laughs> no problem. Uh, let's start off, Ayaz, with that Moto X uh, teaser ad and the sign-up page. Yeah, Motorola just put out an ad for its upcoming Moto X phone that's going to run in the July 3rd editions of the New York Times, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. Uh, the ad reads, the first smartphone designed, engineered, and assembled in the USA is coming. There's lots of ad copy talking about how this is the first smartphone you can design yourself, and it'll be as unique as you are. And it features that new Motorola logo that debuted last week. If you haven't seen it, it's that familiar M Batwings logo with a multicolored ring surrounding it. Uh, Motorola, the text itself, has changed to a lowercase softer font or typeface, and it has the words, a Google company, below the logo. Uh, the ad shows two people jumping off a dock into a body of water. Uh, amazingly missing from the ad itself is the any phones whatsoever. There is a person in an X shape, so I guess that's helpful for the Moto X phone. Uh, Natalie, what do we think about the design by you? What, what do you think that means? Is that laser etchings, colors, built-to-order phones maybe? Well, I was thinking about this as I was reading some of the other stories in the lineup that maybe they're trying to capitalize on the user-generated community type like um, – Kickstarter kind of popularity, but or, or they just think that phones need to become more personal. But I don't know, like when you think of big purchases that become personal, like a car, you know, you really go to the store when you need one and then you kind of put stuff on it later. Like my husband and I were talking about this. Who really goes to the trouble to mod their stuff? like your car and your phone and, and that kind of stuff. Like, do you care that much? There are people who do. And those are the people that, you know, order the chrome skulls to put on their hood. Like, how how much do you really go for that? I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not the kind of person that does that. I need one. Maybe I'll get a fun case later. We know, have a lot of think? people in our audience who, who, who do mod stuff, but your point is well taken. The, the vast majority of people just want to buy the thing, maybe buy a case and, that, and then go with it. So when I look at this, my first reaction, and I'm not saying this is what's going to happen. I think you're probably right, Natalie. It'll be some sort of like design uh, etching, you know, skull face 
thing, whatever, you know, you want to put on it. But I was hoping it was I get to pick processor speed. I get to pick specs. I get to pick screen size. I get to actually design the phone the way I would design a computer, like a PC. When Because when you buy a computer, you don't have to mod it. You say, oh, I can afford this much RAM. I can afford this size hard drive. I want this processor. It would be fantastic if, if buying a phone could work that way as well. But then we're getting into, there's two different things here we're talking about, either personal yes. customization, which we've seen Dell do a lot of, or we're talking about customization of under the hood, which we've also seen Dell do, and then you get $20 to death. Is that a is that a phrase? You get twenty dollars to death, where you're like, oh, the shoot, I want this thing. The nickel has inflated to become twenty dollars. Yes, exactly. Right, and so that's not a super fun experience. And then it puts the, all the onus on the consumer with like, oh gosh, okay, I think I want a Qualcomm chip. What does that mean? And and what's the speed that I need? Am I going to be keeping a lot on the phone? And then you right back to dealing with the guy in khaki pants at Best Buy, where you're like. How much storage do you really need? You know, not that I hate, I, I don't mean to make fun of Best Buy employees. I'm sure they're all wonderful. It seems like the under the hood uh, modification, Tom, probably makes the most sense. And it might just be, this is sort of a marketing spin on what many of us can do with smartphones already, where it's like, well, okay, how much storage? Uh, do you want, or do you feel like you can afford? And and you know, do you want to upgrade to uh, uh, having more, you know, like an expansion slot or something? But with different screen sizes, I mean, how how many screen sizes could they offer before it stops making sense for you know an assembly line? I mean, I guess two. It seems like bigger is better in consumers' eyes, at least for a lot of consumers. So. I don't know about the etching and the, I don't know how much on the outside uh, these phones would look different besides color, which I, as I think you mentioned, I mean, that seems like that's a pretty safe bet. Color's something that people usually, they really like a color more than another. So it would feel, it would give the consumer a sense of ownership. To, to touch into kind of rumor land a little bit, I think maybe it's a little bit more, substantial because it was teased back in February, but Android and me had some sort of leak that had to do with the Moto X being highly customizable. Along with that, they had other information like different materials that you could get the phone in. So if you wanted metal, plastic, or even wood as a possibility of, which I think that's kind of weird, but that would be definitely interesting. Also customization before the phone ships to you. So you could actually log into a web portal and customize the wallpaper uh, some of the look and feel of the phone so that when it ships to you, it arrives to you around those details. Now, again, that's... You're talking about software details because you're just saying customization, but you're saying customization of the operating system and the, the look and feel of it as it works on the screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. Now, that's if the rumors that were, you know, back in February were, were to be believed, but, you know, they called it as far as being a highly customizable phone before we even knew this ad that touts it quite a bit. So, who knows? Just, if it's just colors. And then every other manufacturer is like, um... <laughs> you can customize your background and your screen already. Yeah. So thanks for that, web portal. If it's just colors and laser etching, it's going to be so much lamer than everything we talked about right now. Yeah. BTO styles and, and web portals. And if it's just, oh, it comes in red. There you go. Well, it comes in wood casing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about Microsoft. Uh, the What did you call it, IAS? The, the Microsoft Management, Management Mix-Up. Mix I like that. Thank you. Uh, Bloomberg reporting on some details around it. Now, Mary Jo Foley uh, of ZDNet and host of Windows Weekly points out that Microsoft's earnings are coming July 18th, and Microsoft has a sales conference July 16th through 19th. So we're likely to hear something before the 18th if this is ready to happen and, and might hear about it at the sales conference. She thinks it's unlikely we hear it at the Worldwide Partners Conference, which is happening next week. Uh, but just to recap, Skype president Tony Bates would be in charge of acquisitions and relationships with software developers. Julie Larson Green oversee, would oversee hardware engineering. Uh, that apparently was a job that Don Matrick wanted before he left. Uh, he was the head of Xbox. Julie is the head of Windows. Windows Phone software chief Terry Meyerson would then take over Windows operating system engineering. Satya Nadella, current head of the server business, would oversee cloud computing and corporate customers. Key Lu, the chief of the online group, would run applications and services engineering. Tammy Reller would become marketing chief. She's Windows marketing right now. And all the finance heads would leave their individual departments and report to the CFO. This is all along the lines of making Microsoft a devices and services company. And it puts Julie Larson Green in charge of the devices. Now, 
Julie Larson Green, if you recall, took over the Windows division after Steve Sanofsky left. Uh, and a lot of people were saying, well, maybe Sanofsky was pushed out. Now Don Matrick leaves after he doesn't get a position that Julie Larson Green is going to get. Natalie, is Julie Larson Green the like the up and comer? Is this a, a march to the sea? Should Balmer watch out for his job? Well, it's very popular to have a woman at the helm. And if she gets pregnant, then, you know, we've really got dueling females. It's a cat fight. <laughs> Do you think that Marissa Meyer and Julie Larson Green could share a nanny? No, they're in two different cities. Or a so nursery? Yeah. Now, but what do you think of they this? They could have uh, this... mommy bloggers everywhere hating on the both of them, and Marissa Meyer would be like, thank you. <laughs> do you think that uh, this idea of putting uh, – here, here's the part that I don't like. I don't know what you guys think. Uh, <laughs> taking the CFOs out of the divisions – to me, is a bad idea. I think one of the things Microsoft has gotten right is that the, the number crunchers don't have too much influence over the products. In fact, I think they have too much influence now being in the divisions. Usually when you have the financial department as uh, consolidated like this, the CFO can tend to have undue influence over the product. But maybe Microsoft doesn't look at it that way. Maybe they think they have too much influence being in the divisions right now. I don't know. All the various heads at Microsoft have enough uh, infighting. So if, this, if the financial officers are causing that as well, uh, having them maybe removed outside of the situation might make it a little easier. So as opposed to being a, a, a negative, it might be a positive since this flattening of, of Microsoft could lead to a simpler system where there's a lot more communication, a unified message, and we know what's going on. I think bringing Larson Green over to the devices section since she was ahead of Windows that I mean, how tightly are software and hardware working together? Very, very tightly. So if, if the person that knows software is running the hardware division, she's going to have concerns that a person that was always working devices might not have because she knows how the software works. The devices have to match to me. It also breaks down in a nice consumer business uh, dichotomy. So you have Julie Larson over hardware engineering, but it's really consumer hardware for the most part. Then you have... Uh, Satya Nadella and Key Lu over the enterprise stuff, uh, the, the cloud computing, corporate customers, uh, and, and the services. Like, although Bing and Office and Skype are consumer and products as well, they're very business friendly. Uh, and, and then Terry Myerson over operating systems. So I, I actually think if this is what Balmer is going to announce, it makes a lot of sense to me. Let's talk about. Yeah. We boxing. need an org chart. Yeah, we'll get the org chart. We'll get okay, that. thanks. <laughs> Let's talk about Boxy. Uh, we, the, the news is breaking as we speak. New York Times now confirming that Samsung has said, yes, we did acquire Boxy. So what else do we know, Sarah Layton? Yeah, so this is basically a story that 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 rose as, as kind of a rumor and, and, and closed as a, a real deal just in the last hour or so. Uh, Samsung has confirmed uh, that it has acquired Boxy. A statement it made to All Things D says... Samsung has acquired key talent and assets from Boxy. This is a spokesperson from Samsung. This will help us continue to improve the overall user experience across our connected devices. Okay, my most obvious, you know, my, my mind initially goes to, ah, Samsung smart TVs may have Boxy software inside. But Boxy's... Boxy has done a few different things over the years. In fact, it's, it's kind of, I guess you could say, pivoted a couple of times trying to figure out how to capture this kind of on-demand cord cutter market. Started out as a web platform to organize video. Then you had the Boxy Box, set-top box, which would be a competitor to something like a Roku. Then back last October, I believe, they announced sort of their cloud-based DVR system. So at this point, Boxy's hardware is made by D-Link. You have to assume probably Samsung will want to, if it continues hardware with Boxy, bring it under the Samsung hardware roof. But what do we all see for the future of Boxy? Obviously, Samsung is interested in the talent. Company is based in uh, New York, but has a strong presence in Israel, where a lot of these uh, the reports of the sale actually started this morning. But do, does Samsung need Boxy software as an interface? Does that make more sense for the future of Samsung connected devices? Natalie, do you do you uh, do you play around with Boxy, or do you have a Samsung Smart TV? Do you think they'd be good a good match? Yeah, I have both actually, um, and I like Boxy a lot. Uh, it, it tends to be kind of buggy and laggy, and you know, it takes a long time to do what you're trying to do with it. So, 
Yeah, putting that straight into the TV sounds like a nice idea. But yeah, I, I'm confused by this by this move as well. Um, like why they couldn't just buy the interface instead of I'm you need the hard. It's well, also I, oh, go ahead, Tom. No, that's all right. I, I kind of think that's what they're doing, Natalie. Uh, they're saying we're buying key talent and assets. And remember that Boxy is built on XBMC and Samsung could easily go out and use XBMC if it wanted to. So what makes sense to me is that they are buying the interface and the people who know how to make the interface. And they're going to ask that team to make an interface work for Samsung, which admittedly has a much worse interface than Boxy, uh, make, make that Samsung TV interface work better. I, I'm now curious this, if, if there's Boxy anything left. Does Boxy still have a, um, a web client? Or they used to have a, a, a actually a desktop client. No, they stopped. Do they yeah. still? They, they, they don't. sunset that. No. They 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 still have it, but they haven't updated it, and they said they're never going to update it again. And do you uh, think they, Samsung has any interest in that and in getting onto your computer? Well, they don't care about the desktop they client. No, they care. They care about the interface that Boxy wrote for the for the Boxy box, and they want to put that on the Samsung TV. That's what I think, anyway. I'm, I'm not just wondering if there's the anything left of your computer screen. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if there's anything left of Boxy they didn't buy. Uh, an, another angle of this is a couple of weeks ago, All Things D had reported that Boxy was looking to either raise another big investment round or to find a buyer interested in Boxy. They've put about they, they've they've raised about thirty million dollars. Uh, now this deal is reported to be at about the same price. And so just on paper, this isn't a great exit for Boxy. I mean, this, this may be something where Samsung is not so much acquiring the assets, it's more a, a talent grab because Boxy was very keen to be sold because it just hadn't really gotten that, that, that foothold in the industry that it wanted to over the last few years. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. That's All it. right. Let's talk a little bit about Apple TV because there's a, there's some similar news there. Bloomberg reporting that Apple uh, nearing a deal with Time Warner Cable. Uh, this would be the first of the big cable companies to come to the Apple TV. I as exciting. Uh, kind of. It's pretty much the same deal Time Warner Cable would have with something like Roku or the Xbox. You have to be a Time Warner Cable subscriber uh, and you have to have an Apple TV to actually use this, obviously. Uh, Time Warner spokesperson said to Bloomberg, we don't have an agreement with them at this time, although Bloomberg says we'll get an announcement on the agreement within a few months. Uh, the same report saying that Apple's bringing in Peter Distad from Hulu. He was the senior VP in charge of marketing and distribution, and Distad will report to Phil Schiller, the VP of product of marketing. Uh, Natalie, if this deal happens, does this confirm the Apple TV is just a hobby because it's just another app that it seems like every box has? If the Apple TV has it, it doesn't really make it special. It's just another also ran. No, it's disappointing. And you have to read far enough into the story to see that it's not for cord cutters. You have to still have a cord in order to have a sign in in order to get to those cable channels. So I'm just wondering when they're going to grow a pair and really go for it and become the cable box. And then, you know, I would play a la carte for just one specific news station so that I could log into those cable channels if I wanted to. Um, yeah, it's, it's disappointing to me. Well, it's the first step towards what you want, Natalie, is to get any kind of deal at all uh, with a company like Time Warner Cable. So, I mean, Apple's been banging their head against the wall trying to get somebody to strike a deal with them. And I imagine you're right. It's, it's going to be something where you have to already be a subscriber to use the Apple TV because that's the way all of these have worked for Time Warner so far. But that's also how Apple does it. They get you in the house and then they start to change the deal and say, hey, but now that you're comfortable working in here on the Apple TV and you see how many people are using it, wouldn't you like to provide a service directly over the internet? And and frankly, I think they all see the writing on the wall that, that their cable TV infrastructure isn't worth maintaining over the long haul. Their internet, comp their internet infrastructure is, and that's where they need to deliver their video in the future. Yeah, Perhaps, it'd be interesting to but... Mike, uh, sorry, Sarah, um, but but Apple, when they first struck the music deals, that was a disruptive music deal when the iPod first came out. So they're capable of this. But I was just listening to Twit this week and John and Leo were arguing, oh, Apple doesn't do wow anymore. They just don't do that. So this is their chance to really be a disruptor. So do that. But I was thinking you could, I guess, sort of save some money. Like, could you, could you? subscribe to these services and have a cable subscription and say you get HBO or whatever, and then you have a login, but you don't pay for the box because you are still renting the box from the cable company. So you could maybe save, I don't know, $10 or $20 per month and just use the Apple TV instead. 
you might not get the full uh, the full slew of channels because of the Xbox deal. You get 300 channels. I think if you get a cable box, you probably get more than 300 channels depending on your package. So even if you didn't want to have the the rental fee, you're going to potentially get less channels. Right. That's true. I guess that's a hacky way of doing it. I'm just thinking through the cheapskate way. I just, I mean, it's so obvious that Apple's like, let's just get the deals that we can get, even if they're not really that attractive to the consumer, because that just means more people will hang out inside Apple TV more often, and they will buy and rent movies and TV shows from iTunes, from within Apple TV, which works well for us. And then, you know, if companies like Time Warner Cable are cool with saving some money and not having to work on their hardware business, then in the short term, that works out well for all parties involved. But eventually, how long before people say, well, wait a second, this Time Warner whole, uh, I don't like, why do I need a subscription? I like so many other things on my Apple TV. So the big thing well, is, once you get, what, oh, sorry, go ahead, I asked. If, okay, if Apple lands all these apps, and we have HBO Go, Watch ESPN, 300 channels from Time Warner Cable, whatever, Crunchyroll, the thing is, they haven't rolled out a search that works on their device. A Roku's got search. If Apple is going to really change an interface, maybe they don't really care that they landed Time Warner Cable, which is on every box. If they can actually get a way where I can find the content easier, I don't want to go find which app has what. The Apple TV doesn't do that right now, and the Roku actually does a much better job, at least the latest version, of searching through all your channels to find what you're looking for. So you don't think it's a big deal Time Warner's coming to Apple TV, it no. sounds like. because Time Warner's on every box. It's like, oh, you got uh, this, <laughs> you got the easiest one. So, But Apple deal. TV is in more homes than Roku. So that's it's a bigger deal for Time Warner. Xbox and is in more homes than Roku. Right. Yes, Xbox is in more homes than the Apple TV, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that I, I think the difference there is you have to have pay for Xbox Live. You don't for Apple TV. So Good Time point. Warner getting on Apple TV is a big footprint for them, though. That's a start. Okay. And exactly. I My point is that this is the start of something, right? It's not the end of something. So once you get Time Warner, then you can go have that conversation with Comcast again and say, hey, wouldn't you like to be on here as well? Then you can start talking to DirecTV. You can start talking to Dish. Dish will do anything for a bet at this point. So maybe Dish is the first one that comes in and goes, all right, we'll not only put an app on Apple TV, but we'll actually deliver it direct over the internet. You won't even have to buy hardware from us. They've already done that for their international service on Roku, so they have some experience in delivering internet TV directly over, over or delivering regular TV directly over the internet. I, I think this is intriguing. I think it's an important marker along the way. I, as I get what you're saying, as a cu customer, it's probably not as big of a deal. This It's just big for the industry. Also big for the industry, and a pointer that maybe Apple's next big wow project might be a watch, is the hiring of a new employee. Yeah, who comes from, uh, you know, the fashion capital of the world. Uh, <laughs> Paul Deneuve uh, was the CEO of Yves Saint Laurent, which is a, it's a huge fashion house. Um, based out of France, and we'll report uh, to Tim Cook to run special projects. Now, special projects, obviously by definition, is not very definable, but what's interesting about Denev is that he did work for Apple in the past before running a variety of fashion houses, uh, Saint Laurent being one of the uh, most recent. His LinkedIn profile says that he was Apple's sales and marketing manager in Europe <laughs> in the mid 90s, one of them anyway. So, you know, there's some speculation online. It's like, well, what does it mean? He's reporting directly to Tim Cook. Okay, we're still out a retail chief. John Browett was asked to leave uh, last year, back in the fall. Um, and he, I think he officially departed at the beginning of this year. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't around that long and nobody seems to miss him all that much, but one would think eventually Apple would like a new head of retail. Or is this a little bit more on the fashion side? Because clearly this guy, Deneuve, is he has a lot of experience with fashion, extremely high-end fashion, the stuff that most of us can't buy anyway. But I don't know that that's really such a departure from what Apple is wanting to, uh, how it's wanting to distance itself from the pack as well. I mean, look at that new Mac Pro, right? I mean, it's it's sort of a thing of beauty. It's, it's, it's what, you know, it's, it's, if you want to pay top dollar, then you get, uh, this 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 amazing product. I don't know. Maybe it's just making the iWatch look really good. Anybody have any guesses on uh, on what Apple wants with a with a couture expert? It's totally iWatch, completely. 
<laughs> it has to be. We've talked yeah, about I watches agree. being accessories. They're jewelry. There's something. If you're going to sell a, 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 a device that could cost a lot of money and it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense of why do I want another device on me? Why do I want to spend an extra buck on something? Mm -hmm. Fashion is the way to go because that's what's but sold. Here's an accessory you don't need. Another accessory. Oh, that purse is too small for you. Oh, that wallet doesn't make any sense. But you're going to want it, and that's what Apple wants. They want you to want something. If this guy can do it for the iWatch, that'll be great because otherwise we're going to get the same old videos with the big white background saying, we we're designing something beautiful, and we're going to have something different. Oh, well, you're going to get those videos <laughs> anyway. That, that, that's not going to change. We might have, a, just gonna like have a catwalk this, guy. this time. <laughs> you know, I've been to um, during Fashion Week here in New York City at CNET. Always, always covered. Always, always sent to the. Um, they always had these events like HP meets fashion meets whatever. Like when the Sex and the City movie launched, they had an event around Fashion Week week where they had models carrying netbooks walking down in very sleek designed dresses, and so oh, netbooks. They, I know, remember? So cute. So there is this idea that fashion and technology have something in common, and it's just something that we take around with us in order to express ourselves. So I don't know if it's not the watch. It's, you know, I've seen, like, on the one runway dresses that say things like you could wear. I, I'm not saying that that's what Apple really would do. Like, they're not going to make a dress. But um, I don't know. Maybe, you know what? I, here's an idea. How about those... Uh, hats that have beers on the side of them you know that people wear to football games we can yeah. put screens in that in order to send and receive messages and then maybe something that goes into your mouth to, i thought you were going to do dual mac pros right <laughs> they're the right size right shape dual mac pros. <laughs> right. i think that's the way to go <laughs> this is kind of like princess leia but it's on a helmet hat yeah do you see where I, i'm going with this i don't I know do. why they didn't hire me i i think they missed an opportunity natalie i really do <laughs> <laughs> pure genius. This is awesome. Uh, I do think that wearable computing is a big target for a lot of companies. And whether it's an iWatch or not, Apple probably is hiring this person, Paul Denev, to to help them with that, to help them with future wearable computing, whatever it may end up being, whether it's glasses or watches or things we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, Pebble is sort of the precursor for watches. A lot of people use it as an example of, well, this is the kind of of an incumbent that's in a market before Apple comes in and wipes it out uh, in the past anyway, whether they're capable of doing that anymore or not. Uh, and Pebble is having a problem with Kickstarter, consumerist reporting on it today, where they're trying to say, we have shipped 93% of the Pebbles. If you ordered a black Pebble, you should have it or it should be on its way. If you ordered anything but a white Pebble, you should at least have a shipping notice for it. Uh, we don't mind if you've pre-ordered and you haven't got your pre-order announcement yet. If you go ahead and go to Best Buy and buy a Pebble in the retail shop when it arrives there, you can just cancel your pre-order. Uh, and meanwhile, people are livid. They're complaining. It's the internet, of course, but they're complaining on the forums. No, I haven't gotten my black Pebble and I backed your Kickstarter. We also have a a sort of related story with Tim Schafer and Double Fine. Remember, they raised $3.2 million to make an adventure game that they have now called Broken Age. They're admitting they bit off a little more than they could chew. They don't have enough money to do what they envisioned. Uh, the first half of the game won't be ready until July 2014. A final release looking like 2015. And remember, they originally asked for only $400,000 and had a target date of October 2012. So this thing was supposed to cost a lot less and already be out, and they're saying, uh, we didn't budget right. So the, my question is, is this just the growing pains of crowdfunding, and we're gonna, this is going to become normal, we're going to get used to the idea that, like, okay, well, you're taking a risk when you back something on Kickstarter, so it may not be for everybody. Or is this, uh, this something that shows that, that crowdfunding is really not the wave of the future that everybody thought it would be? Natalie, you come down on one side or the other, or do you have a totally different opinion? Well, I think those are the same sides, is that crowdfunding is not what we thought it was going to be, and also there are growing pains. Um, I don't think that those are two different arguments. I think all, 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 of, the, all of the above is what I'm marking C. Yeah, I, I, I think you could easily make an argument for that. Uh, that these are growing pains, and, and I guess you're right. If, if these are the growing pains, it won't be for everybody in the future. I mean, this is the sort of thing that large companies also have issues with, except exactly. that you hear about them less or they're less of an issue because you've got supply chain partners and you can throw money at a problem like, hey, this color is not turning out as well as we thought it would. I mean, the whole white iPhone was reportedly delayed because they couldn't get it white enough for a while. 
So when you're a company like Pebble and you're working with something like Kickstarter, yeah, I mean, the interest being there is all great and everybody gets really excited and it's like, they've raised so much money, so much more than they even wanted to. So this must mean that it's going to all work out. But that just simply isn't the case. There's not one manufacturing partner that you go to and say, we've got a successful Kickstarter campaign. Let's make as yeah as many Pebble watches as we can possibly pump out. This stuff is hard. So you end up partnering with a, you know, a company like Best Buy in this case in order to be viable in this market. And it ends up upsetting some people who say, well, wait a second, this is not what we were promised. Yeah, and well, it's, think it's, of all of the things that go into being someone who funds a project. If you're a venture capitalist, you you know have experience in mergers and acquisitions. You can look over a business plan to see if it's viable. You know the space. You know the competitors. So just anyone who thinks that's a great idea is not necessarily going to have the you know like I would want one of these. That doesn't mean that you can bring it to market. So sort of leaving the VC business to the masses is like you know. And you can't just leave businesses like that. There's a reason these people are successful or not. Well, and we're doing something new here, right? I mean, it's it's one thing to risk millions of dollars as a VC, and you do need to know what you're doing there. It's another thing to risk $50 or $199 on a product because you think it looks pretty cool and it helps it get made. But we're learning the rules of the road there and who should be comfortable with that and who shouldn't. And we're also seeing the production process in real time. Usually this stuff happens behind closed doors. We don't know that there's delays. We don't know that there's shipping issues. All that happens is that one day they say, the Pebble Watch is at Best Buy and you go and buy it and nobody cares. What the difference is, is that they had to open it up to letting people see their manufacturing process because they promised them the watch before they had made it, right? I, I think the VCs probably get watches in, and products before they're made, but you don't see them out in public complaining if they didn't get it in time or got to retail first because they're more interested in the money. With Kickstarter, people are more interested in the product. That's and why they did it. The people behind Ouya and the people behind uh, Pebble, they have. I think they're really having uh, PR issues. They are not getting their products out to the people who backed them in the first place, and these people are going to be vocal about that right away. If there's something really annoying about... Uh, being promised to get something first when it hits retailers before you get it. If you're going to put that money in the beginning, that's something that you ex you had this expectation. So I don't think this is necessarily a crowdfunding issue. It's a management issue. These guys are putting out their products. They had contracts in place with these retailers. They want to get their products out as soon as possible, but they're hurting their image. So I don't know if this is crowdfunding. This is just Ouya and Pebble and just these guys going, well, look, we want to make money and that's just business, but we're going to step on a few toes as we're doing this. All right, let's move on to the randomizer. randomizer. Here's something on Kickstarter. Internet-enabled pillows that glow at a distance. So when you're traveling, your, your loved one or your child or maybe even your pet could lay on the pillow hundreds of miles <laughs> away, and you'll know it because your pillow will glow. And if probably not for pets, but if the person is wearing the armband, you can hear their heartbeat. Uh-huh. Jason, when you're traveling, wouldn't you like this for your child? Oh, Natalie, man. I, huh? I would love to carry around a nice big electronic pillow with me everywhere I go. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. So you don't care about your child's heartbeat? I do, but I, but I do, but I generally I know that it's still there. I guess I don't need it beating <laughs> through the pillow to, to prove that to me. Plus, we learned from friends that men don't really want to cuddle with you. They want you to move away. That's the whole hug and roll. You guys watch that's, Friends? That's a stereotype. That's oh, yeah. Stereotype. Well, I don't think like men you, don't like to cuddle. Do you have to hug the pillow or do you have to lay on really it? They don't really like it. Like, do you, must you hug the pillow? Don't tell me what I like. Fall asleep on it. You know, this, this, this is... This is a <laughs> stalking tool masquerading as something very cute and romantic. Here's All right. What's gonna yes. If you, Here's if you what's going to happen. This is a check in you service. Down, you know, you've somehow check. gotten this, you know, your partner, what, whoever it is, guy or girl, to agree to this, like, really cutesy idea. And then you're freaking out because they're not where they're supposed to be. Then you're calling them and texting every two seconds. Why are you I on was your pillow? All night where for are your you? Pillow to glow. Bad <laughs> idea. A stocking pillow. I love it. And really, you have to. It has to smell like your significant other, not just sound like it. Because I can put an app for any old heartbeat, right? But it's got to smell like their feet or whatever. And then it's real. <laughs> oh, so they think you're there. Put a How is there no like a FaceTime with this thing? There should be a camera in this, right? <laughs> this should have that. This is when you're going to do the face-to-face -face conferencing. But then you, all you're going 
gonna see is what my mom calls the salmon. When people fall asleep on airplanes, they look like a salmon. So you're like, like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you're gonna see. Well, and this hooks, Who this, wants to see that? This does hook up to your phone. So you already presumably have some sort of either FaceTime or Skype or something on the phone that it's connected to anyway. So romantic. Yay. Let's see what's on the calendar. Oh, this is this is some romance for you guys. Everything Everywhere EE has announced uh, on the 4th, which is tomorrow, they will offer double speed 4G network across the UK, which uh, besides Korea is the fastest 4G speeds in the world. In theory, users could gain access to top speeds of 150 megabits per second, although EE says average speeds closer to 24 to 30 megabits per second. Uh, also in the news, Love Film says it will stop uh, UK game rentals by August 8th. The Amazon division also confirmed in a blog post that the option is no longer even available to new subscribers. So they're phasing that out. And if you're in Japan and you're pretty excited about the Xbox One, you might not be as excited to learn that Microsoft Japan President Yaz Yazuyuki Higuchi has said in an interview that the Japanese market is considered tier two by Microsoft and should not receive the Xbox One until 2014. All right, so Natalie, you, you have to take off, is that right? I do, yeah, I've got okay. to Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for being on the show. It's always great having you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm sorry about the microphone issue, but I enjoyed talking to you and happy 4th of July, everyone. Stay safe. Yeah, happy Independence yeah. Day for you Usans out there. And uh, Crash Test Mom, is that the best place to go these days to see what you're up to? Yeah, that's my new show. It's kind of CNET meets uh, Baby Gear. Doing nice. For that kind of Check stuff. it out, yep. crashtestmom.com. We'll see you later, Natalie. Peace Thanks too, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We got a message from TechnoSquid. I was catching up on the last few episodes episodes of TNT, and a couple of the stories struck me as having a similar thread. Don Matrick moving from the head of Xbox division to CEO of Zynga, and the rumors that Google and Apple entering the console gaming market. Who would benefit more from the expansion of Android and iOS games into the living room more than Zynga? And who better to lead that effort than a former head of Xbox? Maybe my reading of the situation is too simplistic, but I took these two stories together as strongly suggesting the Android game console rumors are accurate, and game development for it would be a new focus for Zynga. That's a really brilliant idea, TechnoSquid. I I don't know what I think of this. I, I don't think that Google would necessarily pick Zynga as their partner or their exclusive partner or their primary partner, but I could totally see Zynga wanting that or Zynga coming out with their own game console. Didn't so Zynga, that, that part makes sense. Didn't Zynga have games for Google Plus? For a little bit, they were one of the first ones to get on there. I think so, sure, because they were they trying were the to separate only. from Facebook a little bit. Yeah. So maybe they're trying to get in with there, but there's also the other Android uh, devices that don't require Google's uh, right, approvals, right. Like Blue Stacks and. I see them as being one of the providers for a Google console, perhaps though. Absolutely, and uh, Google Plus a good good memory there. All right, well, that is it uh, for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, don't forget to go to our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, if you would like to make your voice heard about what stories we cover each and every day. Uh, you can find lots of other people. Thousands of people from our audience are in there submitting stories and voting on the stories helps us figure out what we're going to talk about on the show. You can also find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, tnt at twit.tv, or give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Uh, don't forget, it's a holiday in the United States tomorrow, so no show tomorrow, but there will be a show Friday. I'm out Friday for Nerdtacular, and then I'm out all next week for a holiday, but Sarah and Ayaz will be here, and Darren Kitchen, well, no, not Darren Kitchen, but Len Peralta will be here on Friday. We'll see you then. <laughs>